For the deeds of a man, not the words of a prophecy, are what shape his destiny. Lloyd Alexander, the High King In the beginning there were four great visionaries, each one more brilliant than their forebears, and of a, a creative mind that might well have defined a century or era, but for four such to have been born in the same age was a boon beyond comprehension. Humanity was truly blessed, especially the Anglosphere, to have had so many great and brilliant men all alive in the same period. To say that they were unsurpassed is to state the very most obvious of facts. Let it be made clear, though, that while the next generation of fantasy writers were brilliant, none of them equaled or came close to matching the brilliance of their forebears. Thus, it was that we moved from an era of golden, unrivaled literature to a lesser era of far less skill in prose, lesser vision, and to an era of lesser creativity. The writers who came after these men were not untalented, though. Not all of them, at least. Some were, but not all. Lewis started off well with his Lion, Witch, and a Wardrobe. It was fitting that it should be he who started the Silver Age with the Chosen One one type of prophecy that never really featured so blatantly in his predecessor's literature, but that he managed to make it work. He focused his story on four children and their coming of age, in what was a fantastic tale against evil which warns of dystopia and madness in a land that has lost its virtue but hungers to regain it in Narnia. But the truth is that while the first volume captured lightning in a bottle, the next several volumes, while financial success were poorly written, evidently first drafts and dull stuff barely more readable and enjoyable than chicken scratches, if we're being honest. This in spite of the stellar cast of characters Lewis had invented in the first book. But while the Silver Age started off uncertainly, Lewis was soon joined by a great many other writers in deciding to tackle the genre. Too many really to count, but most noteworthy amongst them were Lloyd Alexander. Alexander was someone who had served in World War II and who had fallen in love in Paris. It was when he was stationed in Wales during the war that he had been introduced, though, to Welsh mythology, scenery, and historic locations. Though at first he struggled after the war to make ends meet, Alexander was to meet with remarkable and very well-deserved success. While T.H. White, who belongs to the mythic age, and who was writing Arthuriana during this time rather than fantasy, for there is a difference between the two, rather than following in White's footsteps to directly adapt older mythical tales, Alexander preferred to chart his own course and intermingle his own ideas with the Celtic lore he had learned. The first of the stories to be published was in 1964 and was called the Book of Three. The story was a simple one about a youth by the name of Terran who longs to be a hero and who gets his chance when the prophetic pig he is in charge of flees into the forest. The story is fanciful and the subsequent stories were to prove no less popular and were to like Narnia before. It charmed a whole generation of children. Alexander was to write Perdane throughout the 60s and was to use this to launch a lifelong career as a writer. They are his main contribution to the genre, and for this he deserves considerable respect, just as Lewis does, for one major element. Both of them sought to add a Celtic element to fantasy, putting it in front and center when it was but mere background before in the Conan stories, for example. And speaking of Conan, he made his return in 1950 with republication of The Hour of the Dragon, or as it was redubbed, Conan the Conqueror. Next came in 1952, The Sword of Conan, then with The Coming of Conan in 1953, the same year also saw King Conan. After it came the Conan 
the Barbarian, the coming of Conan in 1953, the same year also saw King Conan, the Conan the Barbarian in 1954, Tales of Conan in 1955, and Return of Conan in 1957 all followed also. Most of these were highly edited versions of Howard's and thus not of the same quality that he had put out. The Conan stories were to be published throughout the 60s and 70s with the next volumes published by Lancer and were to see Decan partner up with Lynn Carter for them. These pastiche novels that they wrote were of varying quality. Some were great, others were barely worth the paper they were printed on. But one thing cannot be denied, Conan had returned, and though it was not Robert E. Howard's Conan, he loomed large still throughout the Silver Age. This Conan, though, not the towering genius of the Howard stories in some volumes, could still be fun, though the intelligence, as said, was dearly missed. Still, there were moments when he could be discerned. This run lasted until 1977 and was not without challengers, as Carl Edwards Wagner, who disliked the changes by Decan and Carter, sought in 77 to restore Howard's Conan. His attempts only lasted for three volumes. There was of course Donald Grant who came out with his own editions from 1974 through to 1989, with the series culminating in the 1989 re-release of The Hour of the Dragon, which was properly titled rather than the 1950 name Conan the Conqueror. Bantam had its own series, one that lasted from 78 to 82, with Ace Maroto also publishing Conan stories during this time from 78 to 81. This wasn't the only way that Conan dominated the fantasy sphere. For 1970, some schmuck from this comic book company you might have heard of went and begged for the rights to Conan. The stories in question were to prove incredibly popular and was to define Conan for a whole generation of children. With the two runs of Conan, one was to go through a whole series of titles, but the most notable one was Conan the Barbarian, while the other major title was, was the Savage Sword of Conan. Roy Thomas's runs of Conan made many valuable contributions to the character and mythology, and have a well-deserved place in fantasy history. He was to also create during this time the character of Red Sonia, who is the bikini-clad she-devil with a sword now owned by Dynamite Comics. She was also to be written for quite some time by Roy Thomas. Though not all Conan stories are created equal, the fact that there was so much Conan shows that he did dominate the genre to a large extent. Hardly a perfect series of runs, they were nonetheless an invaluable contribution to history's finest genre. These are the major stories of the time, at least those produced for Conan. There were other great tales, such as The Last Unicorn in 1969, one which Joe holds up in high esteem as the greatest, most philosophical of all Silver Age tales, though it is overshadowed as a great deal of the Silver Age by two pieces of work that were to taint the whole of this age. The first that will be referred is Earthsea, a tale without a plot, a world barren of lore, history, and without any decent prose. Mere words on a page with no great meaning. The book and story were written, if one could even use that term, by Le Guin. But needless to say, Le Guin sought to subvert the boy's own tale and the notion of the energetic, if impulsive youth who sets off on the adventure only to suffer and learn wisdom as established by the likes of Lewis, Alexander, and others as they had veered the genre towards following in the footsteps of Arthuriana's themes of the hero's journey as a boy's own story. The next that must be referenced that worked to subvert the genre was Elric. What Lewis did for the boy's own journey, the author of Elric Melnibone did for some adult fancy tales. Elric's writer, interestingly though, is a more complicated man than Le Guin and there is nuance to many of his views, many which have changed and grown over the years, so kudos to him. But for one thing, Elric was a physically weak individual who disdained his people's debauched ways as they had given into debauchery the more civilized they became and who relied on drugs to maintain his strength. Normally you could see why a hippie 
would love the character, though there is a nuance into the argument of civilization versus barbarism, as there is some Conan influence here. Though given the initial physical weakness and a coming from civilization and a drug binging, it is obvious that Elric is a subversion and inversion of Conan. Does that mean all Elric stories are bad? Well, not entirely, though their cultural influence has not been exactly positive, as the inverting of themes and ideas inherently to the genre would serve to inflict a deadly wound against it so that Elric is well and deservedly forgotten by the larger population. Though if you're a fan of his, let us know in the comment section as some of the tales and ideas therein and many of those of his author are commendable, as few men have done so much to keep Burroughs, Howard, and many other writers' memories alive than he, so he does deserve his place in fantasy history, though as Elric scrutinized and read cautiously. Thus were the seeds of the downfall of the Silver Age planted in the early 60s and were to flower and flourish over the course of them and the seventies, encouraged by wastrel hippies who hungered to rebel against and reject the better stories of Tolkien, Howard, Disney, Dunsany, and countless others who provided healthier stories for societies at large. While all this was going on, in rural America, there was a creative game designer with a love of whimsy, fantasy, and art and gaming was working on a series of model games which slowly evolved into a series of supplementary guides that relied more on imagination. This man, a creative titan in his own right, was known as Gary Gygax. Gygax loved fantasy and loved imagination. It was he who, who planted the seeds as far back as 1974 for much of the ideas that would come to rule over the next stage of fantasy. He was to write the first Greyhawk Adventure module in 1977 after meeting with some success with his creative ideas and gaming ideas in 1974, just before his partner in crime passed so that the sole owner of their works was Gygax, who was however devastated and slowed down by his passing. Yet as said, Gygax had soldiered on with impressive resolve and dedication. But Gygax's influence would be better felt in the next stage of fantasy when he would become strangely infamous, if briefly, so through the 80s. In the meantime, Disney had produced Sleeping Beauty, a visual masterpiece. Though its story is rather lackluster compared to other Disney projects, after this, the company had dabbled with T.H. White's Sword in the Stone, which was an animation wonder and is still rightfully touted as a masterpiece. There were other Disney works, mostly of animals and lesser works, with the next noteworthy picture of a fantasy sort being an anthropomorphic sort in the form of Robin Hood in 1973, a film that has inspired one of Joe's own works and which had some of the most finely drawn Disney characters of all times. The film, though, was not an immense success like Snow White, Cinderella, or Sword in the Stone. Disney, unfortunately, fell into squalor and difficult times, falling away in the view of Don Bluth from the path laid out by Walt. Once the nine old men were likewise gone the way of their leader, there was only a few left at the company with Walt's vision with the animators led by Don Bluth leading an exodus from the studio at the end of the 70s. Don goes into all of this in his great biographical book, Somewhere Out There, My Animated Life, which you should buy for a full history of animation, fantasy, and much more, especially since there are few men who have exerted a greater influence on animation and fantasy literary history than him. Disney no longer in the game and with studios producing a few movies, mostly of Jason and the Argonauts and Hercules in stunning masterpieces throughout the Silver Age, movies which used Harryhausen's incredible effects with his movies culminating in the Clash of the Titans in 1981. To an extent, it can be argued that this movie was the last real hurrah of the Silver Age, which had begun well with an explosion of writers and artists, only to have died with a whimper and increasing squabbling over properties or pay or creative vision. It is suitable that Harry Housen, who was there throughout it all, 
should give this era its final climax the way he did. The next age though would be different. It would begin somewhere around 1980 and 1981 with this era ushering forth even more comics, novels, movies, and even stories in a new medium known as video games. Ultimately, where the Silver Age writers had striven to rebel or to otherwise chart their own course, the Bronze Age, for the most part, would seek to emulate the Golden, strangely rebel against the increased increasingly dull Silver Age. And now, if you have enjoyed this video, do give your thoughts in the comment section and smash that like and subscribe button if you haven't already as though you were Conan striking down his enemies.